Welcome back to the Demystify Side podcast. My name is Anastasia. I'm Michael Silo. And today we are talking about Shakespeare. Specifically, we are talking about the fact that perhaps Shakespeare did not write his own plays, and in fact they're the work of a man named Sir Thomas North. We have with us Dennis McCarthy, who is an independent scholar who arrived at this by way of trying to trace the origins of Hamlet, and in the process of trying to figure out where Hamlet came from, slowly starting to realize that perhaps A, Thomas North was the one who wrote Hamlet, and B, perhaps Thomas North actually was the originator of most of Shakespeare's plays. And so he has been working with two established academics, June Schluter and Michael Blanding, who are supporters of the theory and who have helped him really research the deep details that seem to add up to the idea that our narrative of this lone genius scribbling away at the end of a long day of work and coming up with some of the greatest works of English literature is just straight up not true. And the story doesn't end there because, of course, Thomas North arrived at his ideas by digging into the deep past as well. And so we end up with, we end up converging on a way that ideas arrive in the world, which is closer to reality than the one which is popularized with heroism in our modern society. And I think that's where the really, really interesting insight arises in this conversation. If you like what we do, leave a comment, tell us what you think, tell us who we should interview, tell us what ideas we should encounter next, and tell a friend. If you have done these things, consider joining our Patreon for just a couple dollars a month. You can help us make our dream of being able to do this full-time a reality. Enjoy the conversation with Dennis McCarthy, and we will see you next time. The scientific revolution starts now. The so many of the people that we talk to are working on ideas that are outside of some constrained narrative. And the story that they tell is one of pain. Bitterness. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's very, very... It's very rare to meet somebody who's actually managed to bring an outside idea into just into mainstream discussion. Not, I'm not even saying so that everybody's signed on to it, but just uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited to hear the story of the road for you to this point. And of course, uh, we should probably start off by just laying out the basic idea here. Um, can you introduce us to the topic a little bit? Sure. Uh, my name's Dennis McCarthy, and uh, I, and along with June Schluter and now Michael Blanding, uh, have discovered the original author of Shakespeare's source plays. Now, this is not controversial that Shakespeare frequently used old plays, and then he revised and adapted them. Uh, we have we know this simply because of all these early references to these old plays before Shakespeare could have possibly written them. For example, there's a reference to an English Romeo and Juliet on the stage in 1562, which is two years before Shakespeare was born. And there's all sorts of other references like that to various, obviously, Shakespearean plays uh, before he wrote them. So it's well known among scholars that Shakespeare often adapted old plays. What I believe I've discovered, and now along with uh, June Schluter and Michael Blanding have proved, is that Thomas North uh, was the author of these old plays, and in fact that he wrote all of them, and uh, uh, which is which is a pretty big discovery. And what is more, he didn't just write them; he lived them, which makes it very thrilling and makes his life very thrilling. And for the last. 15 years have been trying to slowly get this idea out there. Why don't people know about Oliver North? Why was... Th uh, Thomas North. Th sorry. Oh. <laughs> I always do that. We've talked... We've had, <laughs> uh, it's one of those things where you're like, don't say COVID, don't say COVID, and then you, you blurt it out or something. Uh, you know, it's it was... Uh, it's something I've been trying to avoid. Sorry. I think there's a Faulty Tower episode about this, which is... Um, Another one of my favorites. <laughs> Yeah, remember the one where all the Germans come and he's not allowed to talk yes. about the war? Yes. yes. Exactly Whatever you do, don't mention the war. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I keep wanting to say Oliver North. Thomas North, yeah. Why don't why don't we associate him with these plays in the first place? Well, there were so few records at the time. There's no literary magazines, no literary newspapers. So whenever there was a reference to one of these old plays or they were described, frustratingly, they never mentioned an author. And Sir Thomas North was a relatively minor figure at the time, so no one was independently studying his life. In fact, there's now only three experts on his life alive today. Uh, and they're the ones, um, they're me and my two, my two uh, research partners. And uh, so he was known best for his translation of Plutarch's Lives and scholars in the had known for a while, but in the 19th century, they really determined that uh, the Roman plays of Shakespeare were based on them verbatim, that that they were taken literally a lot of the passages straight from Thomas North's Plutarch's Lives. Shakespeare never treated any other writer like this. If he's doing the story in Hamlet, yes, it's an old story, but everything in Hamlet is completely expanded and invented. The other plays are based on... Um, on old legends and stories, but the Roman tragedies are straight adaptations from Thomas North's work. This is how Thomas North was known, um, uh, mostly known before uh, we started discovering that he was also the author of the author of the source plays. And so, who is who is Thomas North? So he's a uh, relatively minor figure. I he led what I like to call a. Uh, rags uh, uh riches to rags lifestyle he was born at, uh to uh the first lord north had a very comfortable life and privileged life up until about 40 and then it was filled with war and uh uh war and poverty mostly for the last uh the last decades of his life and he was a playwright for Leicester's men for the earl of leicester this was something that's newly discovered and uh, the Earl of Leicester would use plays to advance his own agenda. And Thomas North and all the writers under him, including Philip Sidney and Edmund Spencer, would write works and publish works or, or write works and have them performed by Leicester's men that, uh, uh, that, helped, that, helped, uh, that helped the Earl and helped uh, whatever, whatever particular issue of the year was that he wanted to uh, push forward. And, uh, He's, Thomas North is mostly well known as a translator, but he's a translator, playwright, well traveled, scholar knight, and it turns out he wrote and lived the Shakespeare plays. Okay, so when you say that he wrote and lived the Shakespeare plays, there's a lot of living in the Shakespeare plays. What do, what do you mean? So it should seem impossible that he actually lived the plays because so many of them are histories and so many of them are based on. On legends. What I mean by that is he transformed the place. He would take stories with malleable storylines uh, with and change them to suit his needs in order to uh, uh, to put forward particular ideas that the Lester wanted and also to re reflect the latest moments uh, of his life. You see this with the crucible and uh, uh, as a perfect example. The Crucible by Arthur Miller is a history play, but it's really based on what is going on with Arthur Miller in 1952. So it's the Crucible is, uh, you know, the witch trials are based on the uh, on the uh, uh, the co communist hunt for by Joe McCarthy and the co congressional hearings that are uh, forcing everyone to name names and the life the personal side of uh, the crucible with the affair with the temptress he had just had an affair with marilyn monroe and his wife wasn't forgiving him for it just as it occurs in the crucible so both sides of the crucible even though it's a really a history play and it's really about events in um in late 16 in 1690s massachusetts it really does reflect uh, arthur miller's life in the exact same way Thomas North did that with histories and would use histories to reflect what he was going through. An example, Henry V, which is really about, uh, which is ostensibly about a war in France that Henry V goes over to fight. And uh, it's really about and used as a reflection of the war in Ireland. And this isn't subtle. He refers to the war in Ireland directly in the play. There's an Irish character. It's considered his most Irish play. And scholars have all known 
that uh, have always known that there was all sorts of parallels drawn in Henry V to the war in Ireland. What they didn't know is that this is because Thomas North was at war in Ireland at the time and was using those historical circumstances to reflect exactly what he was going through. Yeah, that was going to be the the follow-up question, which is what does his world actually look like? What does the time period that he's inhabiting look like? What are the what are the geopolitics? What are the things that are that are driving his day to day look like? And how much earlier was this than Shakespeare, by the way? Thomas North is twenty nine years older than Shakespeare, and so he wrote starting in the fifteen fifties into the fifteen eighties, early fifteen nineties. We believe we have Cymbeline uh, and the Tempest. Uh, he was writing in the early sixteen hundreds, uh, just before he turned uh, seventy. Wow. And the the politics, this is Elizabethan England mostly. Elizabeth comes in in 1558, and the Earl of Leicester wants to be her husband. So a number of the plays are attacking the other suitors of Elizabeth. Uh, first was the King of uh, Eric the Fourteenth, the King of Swedes and the Goths. Another is uh, the Duke of uh, the Duke of Anjou and Duke of Alençon. Uh, another is uh, Don John the Bastard. All three of these become villains in Shakespeare plays simply because Thomas North at the time was vilifying these people that were uh, that were trying to uh, trying to marry the queen. And Lester, of course, was furious and he wanted to be king and he he was trying to stop it. So the 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 most anti-goth play and the biggest play ever to warn about the consequences of marrying a foreigner would be Titus Andronicus, and uh, that that play was was originally written Titus and Vespasian in early 1560s, exactly when the uh, when the king of the Swedes and Goths was trying to marry the queen, and the play serves as a warning. Much ado about nothing is Don John the bastard as a villain, uh, and same thing Henry the Sixth, uh, Part One, particularly as the Duke of Alençon as a villain as well. And all these were anti-marriage plays or anti-queen marrying, uh, marrying these foreigners, marry the, the, the proper Englishman, Earl of Leicester instead, is, was the argument. So is the idea that the events that are being referenced here could not possibly have been referenced by Shakespeare because he came along too late? Is that Well, a- well there's that. That's just one one small aspect we found um it's not just thomas north's life or what he was living at the times and we can independently date these plays so we've already published and by the way this isn't controversial when we show it one play at a time so uh june schluter and i published an article in 2014 in cambridge's shakespeare survey that set, shows that thomas north did write the source play for Titus Andronicus in 1561, 1562, um, and that Shakespeare then adapted it as uh, the original play that North wrote was called Titus Vespasian, and North and Shakespeare adapted it in the early 1590s as Titus Andronicus. And you, we show go through the play and show why all of these older references are occurring. But there's also Thomas North's passages in the play, uh, so that he's constantly remembering what he wrote. As a translator, he wrote all these humanist humanist tracts like Dial of Princes on the proper behavior and beliefs of princes, and he would take those those passages and they would end up in the plays and you can date the plays in a number of different ways one of them is through the source tales that were used or what they were what they were borrowing so titus vespasian is very linked is linked very much has always been known to gorbodoc which is a 1561 which is a 1561 work then there's thomas norris passages from his latest translation which is 1557 uh lester at the time hates the Goths, all these things come together, independent lines of evidence to give you exactly the date and reason and why Thomas North wrote it. And, uh, and we just can do this for 50 years. We can do this play after play, year after year with everything. And when, Tom, when Thomas North starts writing Plutarch's Lives, then the plays start quoting Plutarch's Lives and start following. Then you get the Roman tragedies and you get the English histories based and deriving from Plutarch's Lives and the comparisons. When he 
Wright's moral philosophy of Donnie, it's the same thing, which is a series of beast fables. But then these passages start coming into the plays. And so you see it year by year, decade by decade, and it's completely explained. And there is no conspiracy. Everyone knows Shakespeare adapted old plays. And uh, and Thomas North is, we've now discovered, is indeed the one who wrote them. Okay, so my first thought, and this is kind of, you can tell me how stupid of a thought this is, <laughs> is how are we sure that they weren't actually the same person? No, we know, we, William Shakespeare has so much, uh, there's a lot of uh, anti who, uh who are people who try to say that Shakespeare is illiterate or, um, you know, had nothing to do with the plays. But by the way, that entire train of thought developed because it's always been known that Shakespeare adapted old plays. This keeps on getting discovered every century. And what happened, there was a great uh, biographer. I'm going to come and answer your question directly in, in two seconds. But there was a great biographer in the early 19th century, uh, Stanley Austin Dunham, uh, who discovered that Shakespeare adapted all these old plays. And a, another writer reading this in the uh, encyclopedia said, well, who was the genius that originally wrote them? Who was the genius that originally wrote them? And wrote this essay just furious, and he thought it was uh, that Shakespeare was being a fraud since he was adapting old plays. And from there, people started developing new theories. And eventually, they, be they became anti-Shakespearean to where they're saying Shakespeare had nothing to do with it. He was a front for a nobleman and all sorts of... It, it became more conspiratorial and uh, and wilder and wilder when Actually, it's what everyone's known all along. He adapted old plays. But we know this because there's all sorts of records about Shakespeare's life. We know when he was born. We know who he married. We know when he got to. He's referenced repeatedly in, in London. Uh, we, he applied for a coat of arms. We know he was he's associated with the theater troops. Uh, he's continuously referred to as an actor and a playwright, but they were also Constantly, he was ribbed by people, fellow satirists and fellow uh, fellow literary insiders as someone who adapted old plays. The very first reference to Shakespeare that we know of calls him an upstart crow, <laughs> which there's a television series in England called Upstart Crow about, about Shakespeare. An upstart crow beautified with the feathers of other writers. And Crow is a Horace's symbol for plagiarism, and that he was someone who was adapting the work of other writers and getting too much credit for it. And that is said about him at the time he's alive. It's said about him the decades after. And now, so was finally, he, was he just an incredible networker? Or why? Why do we know Shakespeare and, and not Thomas North? Mm. So it's a little like he became the sharer, producer of the plays. And he was the one running the theater company. So it's a little like why we know Disney and not the Walt Disney and not really the original authors and and even animators of Bambi or uh, or Cinderella, etc. So he became the of the theater troupe, the public theater troupe. It was Lord Chamberlain's men at first and then the King's men. He became very renowned. I'm sure his name was on the marquee. He became known as the one presenting these plays. It was Shakespeare who purchased the plays, and it was Shakespeare that produced them. They did produce 40 plays a year about his theater company. He, he could only write two. So he's adapting a lot of the plays he purchased were old plays, or he had hired other playwrights to help him. How do you and purchase it, a play? Yeah, that hold, was hold be my question, too. Yeah. Like, what oh, do you mean the, purchased he, a play? Like He purchased the... Play, we have a record from Henslow, which is another theater manager at the time, and that's how companies produced all their plays, and they produce a lot of plays per week. Uh, they wouldn't play like consecutive plays in a day. It's remarkable how much work they did. And well, did, was there like a clearinghouse for this? Like how? How is no, it? No, no, no. They would they would go directly to the to the author. To the author, the uh, Shakespeare would meet. This is. London's actually, you know, a square mile at the time. And, you know, it's, and all playwrights would just go in and 
In fact, Shakespeare got credit for other plays that he produced, which now we, which are considered apocryphal and written by other people, like Yorkshire Tragedy is now considered uh, written by Thomas Middleton, just from stylistic analyses. But it was published during Shakespeare's day with his name on the title. And that's because he probably helped adapt it. He would have been the one, the playwrights get paid for it. And then he's the one that produces it. The company owns the play as much as anyone, but Shakespeare's name is the one. And this is also true with Locrine, which was likely written by Green, had Shakespeare's initials. And for the first five plays that Shakespeare uh, that had Shakespeare's name or initials, it doesn't say written by, it says corrected or augmented or overseen. Mm. And um, because that's exactly what he was doing. It reminds me less, the, the Disney example, I think maybe makes more sense as the Netflix example. It's as if Netflix buys the plays, buys the TV shows, and instead of keeping the original director or producer's name on it, it's like the CEO of Netflix's name on all the shows. A little bit. R- a little bit. But- there's extra production, right? I mean, how, how, how dramatic are these adaptations? Are, are they word for word plagiarisms, or is he just taking the basic idea and making his own form out of it? Well, that's something I've tried to steer away from simply because I'm in my two my two uh, co authors and co researchers, Michael Bland and June Schluter. I want to name them all the time. Uh, absolutely lovely people, and have been. Uh, have made some such such extraordinary discoveries on this. I believe that Shakespeare was much uh, much more involved in terms of w- was really the genius in doing a lot of uh, 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 adding a lot of the genius touches. I'm thinking Thomas North is more the genius, regardless. And you know whatever view you want in terms of how much the influence is, uh, uh, you, it has to be admitted at some point that Thomas North is the original author and that these plays are indeed adapted. If you look at, I have SirThomasNorth.com, and you can go down and look at a lot of the passages. These are from his prose works that are borrowed and used in the plays. And you can see how close some of them are. And in the Roman tragedies, it's often verbatim. And it'll go line by line or mm-hmm. just paraphrase. And it's, you know, you have to cut it down into blank first. So you're changing prose into blank first. But um, uh, you get to see it. The the Roman tragedies. So Antony and Cleopatra is closer to Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra is closer to Thomas North's chapters on Antony and Cle- Cleopatra than, say, the movie Silence of the Lambs is to the screenplay Silence of the Lambs mm-hmm. or Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is to uh jackson's lord of the rings it's like today if we were to say that uh jackson wrote uh lord of the rings rather than token is the way i kind of view it and i think that um that's a really interesting analogy so and this just to be clear was this a particular moment in the culture in london like was thomas north also purchasing his ideas from people or was this something that sprung up later no the first uh, remotely successful commercial theater w- wouldn't be built until uh, 1576. And then even then it took a while for it to really get started. But by the 1590s, it was a, uh, it became a new art form that the public wanted to see. And that's the first time that even really plays started getting published. There's about 3000 plays. Uh, this is from uh, 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 Shakespeare's, Lost Place is a great new book on that studies all the lost plays of Elizabethan England. There's 3,000 plays in the commercial th- theaters from like that were uh, that were written, and only 543 survive, and that we really know about. And uh, many of those are anonymous, so it's a very very small percentage. It turns out about less than really over well over 90 percent. Well. Thomas North was writing plays never got never got printed, but once in the 1590s, Shakespeare started getting uh, credit. A few of Shakespeare's plays were published, but most of Shakespeare's plays weren't even published until after he died. So most uh, most playwrights were not uh, did not think of that as a as a, a viable or a steady revenue source. Publishing plays it was they were meant to be performed. That's where they got their money. 
Um, so, but you said that, uh, the, when was the year that the first theater was built? 1576, first successful one, really. And, four, four, four plays near London. And so before that, were people who were writing plays just writing them to be performed on some small scale? Is this yes, the first? So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So Tom, Thomas North would write plays, court plays. They were played, uh, performed either before the Queen or they were performed at noblemen's houses. And that was it. And sometimes there were certain inns that would have plays or inn yards that would uh, have them perform. But it was mostly to convince the other noblemen who were important decision makers to, you know, some particular idea. Plays were almost all propaganda. And that's what they, what they originally were. That's, so this is so this is so fascinating to me because I see a parallel between the democratization of the the plays as a vehicle for social commentary to to a similar thing with the printing press where all of a sudden you get widespread access to books and the books contain ideas that change people's minds and then if you go all the way to the modern day you have the internet which is expanding people's access to ideas as well and so i just i'm really fascinated by by looking at this inflection point and the role that uh, North and Shakespeare are playing in it and the way that the spread of plays into the public sphere changes the way that people interact with society and with oh, each other. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's, uh, that's excellent. Yes, there is, a, there is a significant cultural change that occurs throughout the 1590s where plays start becoming widespread and eventually they start becoming published. Uh, there's another analogy which also helps explain what happened with Thomas North and Shakespeare. Uh, uh, as is well known, a lot of the comedy skits from the 30s and 40s that became famous, Abbott and Costello's Who's On First, were actually based on older vaudeville routines. And, for example, in uh, Abbott and Costello's Who's On First, you'll see that everywhere, and it's called Abbott and Costello's Who's on first? And it became, I think it was 19, it was Time Magazine's comedy skit of the century when they were <laughs> ranking everything at the, they ranked everything when, uh, when it changed over to 2000. But, uh, but they weren't the original writers. They adapted it from an old vaudeville skit called Who's the Boss? Now, who wrote Who's the Boss? We don't know. Uh, it kind of got lost in time. We think it even was written in the 19th century, uh, this is conventional. I'm not breaking any news here. Uh, it's the same thing with uh, uh, Niagara Falls skit with the Three Stooges. They used to do a Niagara Falls skit, old vaudeville skit. A lot of their routines were old vaudeville skits. They they adapted. Now, if you can, if almost every question you have with why don't we know Thomas North wrote it has an analogous question with who's on first and Abbott and Costello, and exactly the same thing happened with. They're, they weren't publishing vaudeville skits because only a few people saw them. There was only going to be certain people that saw it at the time. There's a new medium that comes up, radio and then motion pictures, in which they needed a lot of material and they needed a lot of comedy material. So they used a lot of old material and adapted it. The people that then became famous for Abbott and Costello and people saw presenting the work, it became known as their work. This is exactly what happened in which there's new theater, the new public theaters. They're purchasing a lot of old plays, presenting them. Shakespeare is presenting these plays. They're, he's the one that becomes associated with the plays, and he adapts them, he writes them, he makes them stage-worthy. Uh, he adds his own, own flair. He becomes famous for it. It's the, it's the one that people seek when it becomes famous and widespread. It's the one who's just adapted it, who becomes associated with it, and people... And the person who originally wrote it kind of got lost in time. It strikes me that this is just how art progresses, though, to some extent. I mean, it's hard to imagine that Thomas North wasn't drawing on plays that he had encountered over his lifetime, too. Right. And it seems to just continue to play out in society. Like, it's quite interesting that, you know, today we have this concept of copyright right which is supposed to protect these specific instances but it absolutely is designed to promote the 
compiling of ideas and the progress of new ideas in, in order to actually make new works that are moving the ball down the field a little bit, I guess is what it comes down to. And I think a lot of people have this idea like copyright is just this miserly law that's there to, you know, make sure people get their money or whatever. But it's it's actually not at all because prior to that, it, you would have been stuck in these disputes over, you know, who came up with the idea for, you know, this particular play or whatever. And then it's like, hold on, hold on a second. Where do ideas come from exactly? You know, I've never right. found an author of any idea that I couldn't trace down into infinity, right. that I couldn't yeah. literally keep studying for the rest of my life and come up with people who had also had, you know, that this person must have encountered uh, or something. I don't know. They're out there in the ether, right? Multiple people develop, uh, you know, huge breakthroughs in science at the same time for similar reasons. The discussion's there, the culture's there, and then all of the groundwork ideas are laid. So yeah. I wonder if it's just not illustrating kind of a fracture in our myth that there's individual geniuses that actually move the ball down the field because no doubt they play a role that these individuals who popularize things, but they're, you know, I hate to, I don't want to be cliche, but they're really standing on so many other people that, you know, you could spend a lifetime isn't it interesting how standing on the shoulders of giants and standing on the shoulders, or standing on a lot of people have like very different <laughs> emotional balances? <laughs> They're propped up by a lot, of, a lot of other work. You know, it's uh, there's right. an, it's an interesting obsession that we have with these singular heroes. I, I think that's something that is okay, did really. Did Thomas North write other stuff? So, like, yes. is, is Thomas North famous in his own right, just not for these plays? Yeah, for the translations. So for these, which were a lot of his own writing. So he would, tra as he's translating, he would also add in certain passages, particularly <laughs> if he has, if he has certain dialogue that he wants to punch up. If there's uh, something he's translating, for example, in Plutarch Lives, uh, uh, there's a famous scene in which uh, Coriolanus is going to, who had been banished from Rome, was going to come back and destroy Rome. He had joined with the enemy, he was going to come back and destroy it. And his mother stops it. This is an, an extraordinary moment in history uh, in that if he destroys Rome, the entire world is a completely different place because Rome won't become the empire that it becomes. This is just before it start, Rome starts really uh, becoming powerful. And his mother comes out you know, of the gates of Rome and talks to him and begs him not to do it. And it's a major conversation in in Plutarch's lives and uh, Thomas North, as you as you read it from the French, he's he's translating French. It's clear that Thomas North feels that that passage isn't. He can make it better. So Thomas North right adds a few lines, adds makes it more visceral, makes it more powerful, and that also then becomes Shakespeare's Coriolanus. And a lot of those passages that North is writing are put in. Um, are put in the play. Uh, Vanessa Redgrave in the recent film adaptation with Ray Ray Fiennes, uh, Coriolanus, is uh, is uh, it does a powerful job on the speech, and but that's all written by North, and that's actually conventional. They know that 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 was Thomas North saying, but I think there's a lot more passages like that, and I I've discovered them. If you go to SirThomasNorth.com, take North Shakespeare borrowings, you will find uh, just dozens upon dozens there's really thousands of lines and passages borrowed taken from thomas north and put into the shakespeare plays so did he buy these plays from north yes so okay. everyone's all the playwrights that are are getting paid by the theater companies uh for their work and so um they, they don't really it's amazing scholars don't really point this out they say that it's that it's um they know that Shakespeare was using a lot of old plays, but they don't really discuss, you know, well, what, did he just steal these old plays or, or did he purchase them? But records at the time and the way Henslow worked, if you can, we don't have the record book, the kind of theatrical manager book from Shakespeare's company, but it would probably be like Philip Henslow, who ran the competing, uh, who ran at the, who was operating uh, theater manager at the Rose. And, um, the, just you're just constantly paying playwrights for what they're doing or the revisions. Most of the times you they were playing them for revisions of older plays and just pay them and pay them, pay them. And um, 
Uh, so yeah, and that's what happened. So Thomas North is well known for the translations. He's written four translations, uh, but uh, now hopefully he's becoming more and well known as a playwright and the original author of Shakespeare's plays. This kind of comes back to what Shiloh was saying about how we only have the space for one figure in terms of credit, where it's hard to yeah. imagine looking at a Shakespeare play and finding the space in that conception of Shakespeare and his relationship to the plays and his relationship to the myth of the playwright and Elizabethan right. England, and then also slot somebody else in there. Even if you acknowledge that that's that that it happened, that he bought the plays for him from him, it just it almost seems like it's impossible to get people to 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 bifurcate the worldview into two people. Well, it seems like it was impossible, right? You you mentioned at the beginning that each one of these revelations could be published independently, but stitching them together, you didn't quite finish that story. But I, I want to hear yeah. about the resistance to stitching them into a, a unified theory. Yeah. So we publish. So we pass peer review and. You know, it was highly complimentary on the fact that Thomas North wrote the source play for Titus Andronicus and showing exactly, exactly when it was. And, and people and Shakespeare scholars can accept that. And most, and by the way, most, I shouldn't refer to Shakespeare scholars on block. The, most of them have been very kind and very nice uh, to us and accepting of a lot of the things what we're saying. But other people start getting more and more uncomfortable when you show that Thomas North, we've also found Thomas North's travel journal. This is unpublished travel journal, handwritten, scribbled out. There would eventually be copies uh, of it uh, that circulate in the uh, 17th century, but unpublished in which passages were used for uh, Shakespeare's Henry VIII and Winter's Tale. And uh, we have other. We found other things which are really smoking guns. And the reason we found them is that we know who wrote the original plays, and we were looking for them. And uh, my partner June Schluter and her husband Paul Schluter is the one who found notice of this of this journal by Thomas North. And uh, th and these were used for Henry VIII and Winter's Tale, and so and that got published. And that's you know that's right here. Mm. And uh, June Schluter, I published that. And what's so, the, what's the? Sorry, wait, I couldn't really quite see the title. What is I'm it? I'm sorry, Thomas Norris, fifteen fifty five travel journal, out of uh, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University Press, and that got some nice notices and uh, some press on that. We found, uh, we found, this became, this got notice all around. This is we found another manuscript that was an important. Uh, uh, used for Shakespeare plays for eleven Shakespeare plays. This became there was news reports all around the world, including the front page of the New York Times on that. And uh, and which book was that? I'm sorry. This was this. It was the. This is the book. It's called uh, a brief discourse of rebellion and rebels because that was the name of the manuscript that we found. And uh, a number of the plays like the there's a character named Jack Cade and uh, Henry the uh, part two, who the story of Jack Cade is in here and isn't in anywhere else, particularly the story of his death. And there's all sorts of other passages that were, that were taken and used, but the re but we know to look in the North family library and look for works related to Thomas North. And we thought we'd find new sources for, uh, for Shakespeare material. We never thought we'd find Thomas North's journal used for the plays, but we have, and these are all, each of these finds have been very warmly well received. But when you take them to the next step, the reason why we found them, we know that Thomas North wrote these plays. And that's why we're looking for them. And that's why we're making newsworthy discovery after newsworthy discovery after newsworthy discovery. Our latest is Michael Blanding found a copy of a history textbook called Fabian's Chronicle. In which inside, which was used for the play Cymbeline, and inside is the outline of the historical elements of Cymbeline found in North Family Library. It's Thomas North's handwriting. It's Thomas North's notes all throughout exactly how you would create a play. This is the first real outline, historical outline for a play ever found in Thomas North's handwriting in, the, in this history book for Cymbeline. 
and we've got more things coming and it's just um and it really is a major paradigm shift here but it's but many are getting very very unnerved by this and think we're kind of anti surf 40 and we're trying to take credit away from shakespeare or something like that we aren't trying to do that we just know scholars are well aware that shakespeare uh, that Shakespeare used old plays, and we're just telling you who wrote them, and we've proof upon proof upon proof. What percentage of Shakespeare's plays are you attributing to Thomas North? Well, we have <laughs> right now. I've got okay. So my this is the last time I'll do this for the th- here's okay. So this is the book that kind of describes it all. Thomas be- North. Oh, go ahead. Thomas I was going to say you have to call it. Yeah, <laughs> Thomas North, the original author of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, in there, I put, I've got significant evidence for over 20. It's really going to turn out to be uh, all but two of them. And those two are uh, Merry Wives of Windsor and the Two Noble Kinsmen. So about... Who'd he steal those from? <laughs> uh, he got... So uh, Merry Wives of Windsor is a Shakespeare-directed project. And I believe he, he did that because of the... Uh, uh, because of the popularity of Falstaff, so he could create another character. Then Two Noble Kinsmen might have been an old Richard Fields play, um, and he wrote that with Fletcher. There's other, there's other, and again, there were many other plays that Shakespeare also got credit for at the time, and that people thought he wrote for a century after his death, including Yorkshire Tragedy, London Prodigal, Loke Crane, uh, uh, Sir John Oldcastle. Plays like that, which we don't think he wrote today, but he uh, he uh, he got credit for it when they were published. His name was on the his name was on the title pages, and that's because he was the figurehead and the major playwright for the Lord Chamberlains and Kingsmen. That's who performed it, and he got and I'm sure he helped adapt those too. And he, he was the name uh, that was put on it. I mean, I can see how that is a troubling proposition, right? To say that all but two of the plays are written by one guy, and then the other yes. two are probably somebody else. Like, I can see why people are are hesitant yeah. to accept yeah. this. Yes. Um, I, I, I think that it really does undermine the idea of the lone genius, which is really satisfying to me. But in a way, it also kind of just places it back onto Thomas North. Because I do point out that it goes from the big, you get to see where the development of the ideas uh, do derive from, because he is taking legends that he has read about these foreign legends, particularly rewriting those stories. And he's using the humanist wisdom that he has written about in his translation. So each of his four translations are collections. He's a collector of collections. Each one is a collection of itself of humanist wisdom or tremendous stories, Plutarch's lives, is of historical stories in which there are all sorts of uh, uh, moralistic lessons also added by Plutarch uh, at the end. It's the same thing with moral philosophy of Donnie. All of the all of it is council literature. These are the most important, significant legend stories in the world. And all these humanist uh, beliefs and theories written out. So he's taking what he's writing. So you're right in terms of everything is kind of derivative or all ideas come from. They aren't invented new. They're threads that are kind of woven together from the past. And you can see this now with the Thomas North theory, how they all come together to form these masterpieces. In, In fact, exactly as you had said, in terms of that, you, you know, you get this, everything is derivative. I point out now you actually get to see the intellectual origins of the canon rather than what it had been was a kind of big bang of uh, of intellectual achievement where, you know, Shakespeare's just sitting in a study after many hours at work performing the plays, uh, uh, running the theater company, then getting, you know, getting to a study and just these ideas and all this humanist <laughs> wisdom forming out of nothing and, you know, just exploding out of nowhere. And instead you see a, an evolution of, uh, an evolution of these ideas. In fact, this is how I first discovered this was, I was 
going to do a bio geography. My background's biogeography, and um, I'd written a book, Here Be Dragons, on uh, on biogeography, and I wanted to do a show how ideas evolve, just like uh, just like species do, and they they spread around the world, and then when they move into different locations, they end up uh, there's speciation occurs, and they end up evolving and changing and and in its various forms. And I wanted to show how this also is true with ideas, cultural memes, whether it's, you know, religion or technology or, 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 or languages, you can see them, you can trace them moving around the globe and you can see how they adapt and change and evolve and um, uh, evolve. And I wanted to show how this also occurs. And I was going to show with Hamlet, I was going to take it the time I didn't, I assumed Shakespeare had originated everything. I was going to show how all the ideas of Hamlet ended up in London and in the mind of a single person. And, uh, but it turns out, uh, if you look for the history of Hamlet, this is conventional. They know that there was an old Hamlet that was discussed in 1589. Scholars do, editors refer to this as the Ur Hamlet. And, um, that had been written before Shakespeare. So I knew a lot of these ideas had already taken place and had already been put in this original Hamlet and that this other person was the, uh, was at least the one who like put, it was, it was known to be a Senecan tragedy, put a lot of the ideas of Seneca and the legend the, the Danish old Danish legend together into this, into this story. And I wanted to figure out who it was. Um, and it wasn't really as hard as you think with all the new technologies that we have available to us. Can you say more about that? Sure. So, so the reason scholars know there was an early version of Hamlet is that the satirist named Thomas Nash referred to in 1589, referred to this English Seneca who wrote this original Hamlet filled, filled with tragical speeches. And, uh, this is too early for Shakespeare to have written. He may not be in London yet. Uh, uh, this He may not have written a first play, so he obviously didn't write his masterpiece uh, by that time. And uh, scholars have long tried to speculate who was the original author of this Hamlet. But I just, I didn't, when I looked at this and I looked at it trying to determine the history of Hamlet, I'm like, well, now we have massive databases and massive uh, search engines in which you can actually piece together exactly what Thomas Nash is saying line by line. You know, uh, you know, it, the paragraph was really an interesting paragraph. And I thought this can be, this can be done. It took me, it took me weeks to go through and really read the whole pamphlet and figure out absolutely everything he was saying. And I had to do this because I didn't know anything that he was saying, every reference that he made by just, constantly plugging it into early English books online, et cetera, and see who he was referencing, who else was he referencing in the, you know, in the rest of the pamphlet. And it turns out he was constantly talking about Thomas North and he's constantly referencing his works. He was uh, uh, it, sometimes by title or sometimes just by the stories in them. And you've, and I didn't know this when I was reading it, you would just discover this when you would plug it into early English books online. And it became clear that that's who he's talking about as English Seneca. And I didn't know who Tom, I wasn't, I didn't know who he was, but you start pulling on this thread and you see other satirists wrote about this guy as well. And they, they attributed all these old plays to him when they called him an upstart crow. One of the reasons is because they were referring to Thomas North he, as the person who had written the, the early plays. Some of the early plays, Green also for Low Crean, he was getting credit for, and they were talking about that as well. I mean, it strikes me from like a larger metaphysical perspective that this is really valuable work because the myth that there are these genius entities really puts. Also known as geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> this isolated entity. It really puts the reach, it really puts the attainment of progress in an individual's lives in this mythical out of reach place, which I think is a disservice to, especially, I think of kids, especially when they learn the history of the great works and 
You know, I often, you know, sometimes my students will come up to me and they'll be like, what's the most important thing, you know, in getting out there and making, you know, succeeding in my career, like succeeding in the world? And usually I tell them they need to learn how to play with other people really well. But I think there's another element to this too, which is really understanding the past. And really, you know, there's no time for that in grad school. If you go to become a scientist or something, you're just thrown into a lab and you're just grinding at the mill. And there's something really, really important about understanding even the ancient past of whatever you're thinking about because ideas have a tendency to get lost. And I think in some sense, that's what must have happened here in this saga is that there are fundamental myths that are so human that they relate to people in this really highly contagious way, right? They just get passed around and passed around because they're so important and they describe something so fundamental to our existence. And if those narratives become out of date or unreachable or somehow unpalatable, then it takes somebody to come along and harness that path, past and put it into language that's relatable to the people again. Like you mean in the sense of if you create the myth of the lone genius who creates a body of work, that what you've done is you've created this unattainable mythical status for what it means to accomplish something in the world for the people that are attempting to look forward now? That and it puts them on a trajectory which I think is isolating and hermetizes them in a way that I think is unproductive. Uh -huh. Because in reality, when I look at people who have done great works, they're, they're really, really involved in the community and in the past. And they're not just going into a cave and thinking about you know, how light behaves or something, right? They're really understanding the struggle, the history of people wrestling with these ideas in the past. And in the case of, I'm obviously not, I don't know as much about playwriting, but it seems like there's these stories that constantly crop up. There's elements, you know, um, these archetypical stories that keep cropping up. And of oh, course, yeah. yeah. They're more Nigel Godrich than uh, Ted Kaczynski. <laughs> Break that down for me. Okay, well, so like Nigel Godrich is a producer. He works with other people. He creates things. He networks. He's the producer that m turned Radiohead from just another band. pop band into Radiohead. And he, he he's really crafted this very spooky sound. And I think he works with other people as well. But he's a networking, creative individual that is putting forth a massive body of work and Ted Kaczynski locks himself in a cabin in Montana and right. writes a single screed and then blows a bunch of people up and it, like he he won't have the that that's the hermitization it inevitably turns you into a into violence against the system that you're turning against because you view yourself as a victim and so you must be isolated and as you're isolated and things aren't working out for you then you become progressively more aggressive and the person who's integrated doesn't that doesn't happen to them because they're part of a larger system they're productive they're making things happen I mean, yeah, I, I think that it's just a real disservice to not understand how great achievements occur. And it's so much easier for people to imagine these gods pulling it off, you know, these near right. god like humans. But in some sense, I think that that's really sad too, because it does alienate people who want to be the innovators of great ideas unnecessarily. And it also just, yeah, it makes it, it's just not. It's just not honest, right? And that, you know, dishonesty never leads to anything good. Right. Well, to your point, uh, I think, uh, for example, it is nearly impossible to say really with any accuracy or seriousness when something was invented because it is, everything evolves. And this is true with ideas, et cetera. So whatever the object is, so many of the pieces had already been invented that the last person who creates it, let's say it's a telephone or whatever, or the car, the last person, you already have the engine, you already have the wheels, you already have the chassis, everything is already already together and just one person is just putting what has already been invented, all these other things by other people. And it's just one stage in the evolution that this person added this element. But there's there were many thousands of individual inventions before that and as you keep on going back uh those derived from 
uh, from other things. Uh, uh, Alexander Graham Bell and Elijah Gray uh, both. So the phone isn't invented for, uh, you know, the tens of thousands of years of human history. Never invented. They both end up filing their patent for the phone on the same day. And the reason we celebrate uh, Alexander Graham Bell is he beat him to it by a few hours. Uh, mm-hmm. Elijah Gray, but the reason now that's imp- that seems impossible. But the reason it is that it happens identically at the same time is that um, it, all of the all of the elements for a phone to be developed had been invented, and so now it's just a matter of what you know one person putting together that last piece. So a lot of times the inventor is that it's just the last piece of something of all sorts of uh material technologies that have been invented by other people and this is true with ideas this is true with stories this is true with you know the hamlet story kept evolving and changing as until it got to until it got to london it's the same thing with with everything it's memes as well as genes that evolve yeah and there's 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 an understanding that's built into us right this was this was carl jung's whole point was that there's things you know that you don't know you know and in literature, I feel like these are the roots of these stories that appear over and over again. Like, yes, of course, people are aware of the past to some extent, but there's some stories that are just so fundamental to the dramas that play out inevitably in our lives. There's things like yeah. my life and your life probably have very many of the same dramas. You know, we we fight with the same demons. They might be a little bit different in circumstance, but there's elements of it just being a human. The archetype. Yeah, it, it's it's really fundamental in some sense. So it's it's astounding you're saying this. This is this is exactly what Plutarch's Lives is about, and exactly what the Shakespeare canon is about is that these stories keep on occurring. That the you know the reason you're studying Richard the uh, Third, and the reason that it's so significant because that type of guy comes along again and again. And the ex- and the toadies that that work from all these decisions, and they they Plutarch's Life specifically shows multiple comparisons. This this tyrant occurred. This tyrant occurred. Look at the similarities here. It's the same thing that um, and it, that is made in the plays with each of the uh, major characters, especially major villains. He's just like so and so. This is what's going on, and they serve as warnings. Uh, Stephen Greenblatt, a Shakespeare scholar, absolute genius, wrote this uh, wonderful work, Tyrant, uh, and showing a lot of what was occurring um, uh, over the last few years was po- completely predictable and shows really shocking things. If you were to, if you were to read the Jack Cade scenes, for example, in uh, in Henry VI Part Two, you would think that it was a spoof on what was occurring today. They wanted to make England great again. They were anti-foreigner. They were, you know, they they nice. they really believe they were going to sweep. They were going to sweep the. Uh, they were anti-elite. Kill all the lawyers as part of that. If you knew how to read and write, you know they're the ones that are oppressing us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was just line by line exactly what was going on, and it's and this is why history repeats itself is because we haven't changed as a species and we're still susceptible to the same um passions and, and well, well this the fight against tyranny is in some sense the most fundamental drama imaginable in some sense right. i mean in in so much as any system of organization tends towards corruption if not un- you know, if left unchecked and so i feel like every single organization uh, even your individual, even just your relationship with your wife or something like anything, can can drift into the t- a tyrannical form if it's not you know taken apart and put back together in a way that's more healthy, right? I think this is the shadow, right? This is the idea that all within us contain the terrible evils of humans and all of human nature, and we choose to play them out. And if we can look at them and evaluate them and see them in ourselves, we can diffuse the bomb. But if we can't, then we become the tyrants. Like, I don't think that uh, a warlord sits around in the evenings and examines his shadow. I don't think that someone who's... uh, But we know the warlord's fate, you know, in some sense, right? Like, the drama plays out for the tyrants. Like, 
The tyranny drama plays is, uh, out for the tyrants, but it could be over the course of thousands of years, right? Like you can have tyranny after tyranny after tyranny after tyranny. And so the one thing that we it's don't know is how long it is. But the one thing that we don't know is how long the tyranny will last because you can have highly repressive regimes that last for a long time. And so there's there's this terrifying Well, there's equilibration. resistance to change too. That's what's really interesting is that you know, you don't, what happens when a tyranny crumbles? Well, you're cast into this terrible darkness of, oh my God, we have nothing now. Or you might just have another tyranny that arises. Well, you very well may. In fact, I would say they all sort of tend, all systems sort of tend towards that eventually. And they have to sort of fall apart. I think that's, that's what makes navigating interpersonal relationships so difficult is that you have to be willing to go into that chaotic state where, oh my goodness, things aren't perfect all of a sudden with me and my friend or whatever. And you have to be willing to like accept that first of all not just sweep it under the rug and then address it before it's too late otherwise the tyranny crumbles and you're you have no friend anymore and it's uh it's and, quite dangerous and that's what literature and art i think tries to tell us right which is that hey these things will recur and they will endlessly arise right right yeah the um <laughs> um yeah uh henry the Henry IV has a great quote on that, um, which if I was smarter, I'd be able to quote right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> Google it, folks. I, <laughs> I can. Yeah, I um, should. Oh, my God. In a, in a, uh, a someone, someone will put it in the comments. Yeah, someone will put it in the comments. Yeah. Um, how much... I, I, so you have access to Thomas North's library. They're Barely. Not, the, uh? not really. Not we really. Defined, we defined each... It's an agonizing process in which June Schluter and Michael Blanding are helping me out. In fact, they're doing most of the legwork there, there right now. In which you got because unfortunately the the North Family Library was completely dissolved in the mostly dissolved in the uh, early 19th century, and uh, we've been and the the each of their books and are scattered across are scattered across the libraries of the world. And unfortunately, you just can't Google it. And find it. You have to go into the library catalog of the particular library to see if they have a manuscript or a book with that was original and part of the part of the library. And um, uh, that's what Michael Blanding found uh, uh, the Fabian with with Thomas North from the North Family Library, and you know this because of a book plate and Roger North, his brother, would write Durham Potty in it and sign each of the books he had. Uh, so that's what you're kind of looking for. But he found that at Harvard Library, in mm -hmm. fact, which was uh, which is fantastic. Got his hands on it, and uh, 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 Thomas Norris Journal is now at uh, Lambeth Palace, and uh, uh, there's a copy of it at Huntington Library. They're all over the world, and so we so it's an absolute agonizing process. But when you find it, they're always you know, they make big news because they're all Shakespeare related. And that's because we know who wrote them originally. Do, do you have much of a sense of North's own relationship to what's going on with the plays? Because they're not that far apart in time. And if North sold the plays to Shakespeare, did they have a direct relationship where North knew what was happening to the plays? Yeah, yes. Yes, the the evidence suggests that in the 1590s, early 1600s. So, to, and again, Shakespeare, Shakespeare and Company, they're putting 40 plays a year. So they're buying dozens of plays from many different playwrights. Um, they worked with Middle, Middleton, Marston, Marlowe, uh, everyone. They were putting on plays or the revisions on uh, putting them forward. But uh, the evidence suggests that Thomas North was uh, was in London. In fact, he's he was paid the most of anyone for helping put down the Essex Rebellion, the famous Essex Rebellion of uh, 1600, and uh, which Essex and Richard II is an important play and historic play, uh, and has historical importance simply because the play is obviously about Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Essex, where Richard II is. Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Essex is Henry IV, Bolingbroke, and they the before they revolted, and it's pro-Essex, anti-Elizabeth, and before they revolted, 
uh, they perform had the play performed by Shakespeare's Theater Company on the day before, on the night before the uh, on the night before the rebellion, thinking that they would get a lot of people in London to to back their cause. How'd that and, work out? Uh, it didn't work out. He ended up uh, they they stopped it, and he ended up uh, being executed. Essex uh, Essex did, but uh, he was kind of a dashing figure. The and the fact that Richard II is meant to represent Queen Elizabeth is uh, was so well known. She actually said it herself. She said it to to an historian. I am Richard II. No, you're not that. When when they came to the to a discussion that that point was recorded by an historian of the of the era, uh, William Lombard, and uh, even when they put the uh, put uh, Essex on trial, they didn't really talk to the play but they talked about a work based on the play which is called henry the fourth but richard the second henry the fourth is both the same essentially both the same work and um they knew all of the things that were changed to make richard the second appear like queen elizabeth when david Tennant did richard the second playing richard the second he wears long flowing gowns and hair down to you know and they they make richard the second very effeminate you know etc mm. and to really put forth and the reason i was talking about that oh that but that was like that was an important moment and Rick, thomas north had written the richard ii in 1570 1570s for a slightly different purpose and it was kind of modified north was working for essex and the question of why no one was ever punished for the play including shakespeare or north who i believe was the original author is because they warned they warned the queen and they know that they had known that North had written it in the late 1570s and that it wasn't as uh, treasonous as it had become. Hmm. And so, but the, the original line of thought that got us here is what was North's relationship to the success of the plays as Shakespeare was putting them on? Like I would be preening if I was writing play after play after play that was becoming well-known and beloved and being played in front of sold out shows. And I was like, I'm the one who wrote that. I sold it to the guy. Yeah. I, my journals would be, you know, filled with, with <laughs> references to that. Right. Uh, maybe no, I'm, so maybe I'm exposing my own like superficiality here. But. No, 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 not at all. That, <laughs> It's actually a great point. Uh, one, the journal that we, the only journal we have of uh, of Thomas North is from uh, fifteen fifty five, which was before he even started writing plays. He's nineteen twenty years old, and it's of a trip to uh, it's of a trip to Rome. Though he would use it for uh, for Winter's Tale and Henry the Eighth, uh, but uh, I'm sure North felt like that. But we also have a little bit of a uh, a modern view of how shakespeare's uh plays were received a lot of times they weren't put on the way you know no one was really going to a uh four-hour hamlet and uh the groundlings weren't sitting there standing there where they had to stand uh most of the time and uh were you know just clapping at uh blank verse <laughs> soliloquies on the uh, plight of man uh the they were cut down. It was more sword fights, uh, less chit chat, and uh, you know a lot more action. And they weren't they weren't instantly seen as these. Oh my God! These these extraordinary works of genius that you know everyone. There's evidence that Thomas North was very arrogant and cocky about his works when they're mm. satirical representations. He believed they. They make it every time they do a satirical representation of him. At the time, uh, they would make him this sort of conceited knight who believed he was the best writer ever, and um, <laughs> so he he probably okay. did think he was a great writer, but he probably wasn't that uh, concerned or, or proud of the play. Shakespeare would have adapted it. They were sometimes cut down. Um, uh, the and he probably didn't, as he was trying to write for, he was constantly trying to write for noblemen and writing and trying to get uh, to become uh, a counselor, so, someone higher up in the in Queen Elizabeth's uh, in Queen Elizabeth's court. That he wasn't really 
that concerned with what the groundlings were saying. I see. So he was a, he was a social climber. He was basically he the reason that people oh, yeah. knew about him and the reason that there were satirists that were commenting on him is because he was basically trying to get to the top of some social pyramid and so everyone was kind of seeing him from the outside. To a certain extent, but they also knew everyone was ready. The they were the satirists would hit everybody who wrote plays. They attacked everyone or if they were rival dramatists, they attacked their weaknesses everyone. So everyone Got nailed, Shakes, as we said, Shakespeare, you know, as Shake scene, this upstart crow. Uh, and there was other, there's all sorts of other portrayals of him as Sogliardo and every man in his humor. Ben Johnson hit Shakespeare a lot. Um, but all of them, John Marston, Thomas Decker, uh, uh, at the time, John Lyley would continuously get nailed and would continue to be spoofed in different ways. And they saw them because they saw them around London. They knew that they each were trying to write plays and trying to, uh, uh, get the theater companies to buy their plays. And uh, they had their complaints about the, they hated the actors. The, a lot of the writers uh, did the actors complained about the playwrights. It was exactly kind of what you think, but even more uh, vicious than normal simply because it was it, it, starving to death was a real proposition and uh, you know, dying of uh, dying of poverty. Uh, Robert Greene essentially uh died because of that thomas kidd died broke um and in pain and so that so there was the rivalry is a little more um a little more intense among these writers simply because sometimes theater companies would buy one person's plays and not another etc 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 how much of a different life were people leading in the cities to the life that we know of today. Like you're talking about these things which are basically the same fundamental patterns, right? You have the critics that are at the newspapers and they're evaluating yeah. the plays and they're, you know, uh, talking crap about everybody and there's the people that are competing in order to succeed. And that feels very, very similar to anything yeah. that you would see today. The, yeah. you know, you're going to die of poverty in an unheated hovel is... Perhaps still the case, but it somehow feels less possible. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. It was worse. Well, it was much worse in every level then. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> my parents definitely tried to talk me out of becoming an artist for that exact reason as well. I feel like yeah. that's a pretty common theme, especially if you're from a place where no one's ever really succeeded at that. I guess it could be the case for yeah. other things besides art as well, but. If there's never been a large theater before and they're constructing the first one in the entire history of London, that's probably a harder career path to be like, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could work for a court or something, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There was still some path. But if you didn't know anybody who worked at a court, then that would seem like a complete pipe dream, too. Yeah, yeah. So, I have, I want to jump into a different subject but i don't want to move on if you have more questions about this you where do you want to go well i'm just curious about your other work as well like you mentioned very we kind of passed through it pretty quickly but this uh i don't even what was the term bio Bio biogeography biogeography yeah Yeah. biogeography yeah so what other topics have you explored in biogeography or are you working on any projects related to that right now or uh no no i've um I'm right now devoted uh, completely to Shakespeare and the Thomas North uh, discovery. But Here Be Dragons was a uh, book I'd published with Oxford University Press in 2009. And uh, and it was it was well received, uh, fortunately. And reviews are quite generous. It's the first time, uh, really, it, uh, the subject of biogeography was kind of brought forward to a popular audience. And it's why plants and animals are where they are. It's one of the most significant uh, sciences in history in that it led Darwin to the theory of evolution, led Wagner to the theory of continental drift, serves as the backdrop to Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. And uh, it's kind of a secret science of geniuses. No one really knew, knows too much about it. And that was the subject of my first Mm. scientific book. Do you think that it relates to the work that you were doing on Shakespeare? Like, what was the thread that got you from biogeography to Shakespeare? Yeah, so it was, It really was. I was 
as as in biogeography, you you find these extraordinary distributions of of plants and animals, and you see how the um, similar species live near each live near each other because they're more closely they're more closely related. So grizzly bears and polar bears are most closely related. And you see this in uh, penguins are all in the south, and you the more closely the the more closely close they are together, the more closely related they are. And Darwin noticed these uh Darwin noticed this as he did his jaunt around the world and uh and noticed the changes that were occurring over space and time. So uh what I wanted to do was show that and this isn't my idea that memes evolve. Richard Dawkins has been talking about it uh, forever. I wanted to show the movement of ideas. You can do this with religions, just as you can see uh, different species moving to different, where well, you have, uh, whether it's African and Indian elephants, or you can do this with languages or religions, where you can see them spreading into different lands, whether it's uh, Mexican, Spanish, and Spain, you'll start to see differences arise. You can do this with ideas, legends, stories, and I wanted to show it with Hamlet. So I wanted to give a biogeographical history of Hamlet, where all those ideas uh, did come from, uh, whether it's both the Danish story, which really started as a uh, Viking legend and went to Denmark, down to France. And with each time it moved, it changed a little. And and uh, Bella Ferre, who wrote it in French, uh, added his own elements to it then it went to london then there were other ideas senecan tragedies which it was kind of moved with started in rome obviously and so hamlet is very much a uh you know the product of the renaissance inspired transfer of ideas across western europe and the motion of books as with the printing press and you get to see exactly how the story evolved just as you would see a species evolve when it ended up uh in a particular region so this is really interesting that you bring up the printing press again because uh, we're working on a book about the future of science. And I think that in order to explain the future of science, you have to go back into the past and in order to be able yeah. to understand how these ideas are generated and how they spread. And I was just reading, uh, there was a, I think her name was Elizabeth Eisenstein. She put together basically a history of the effect of the printing press on the development of the the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment. And I I wonder if your research has given you some context to the massive shifts that were happening in culture at the time that these books are getting passed around. Because Shakespeare is obviously this high point that we look at and when you when you glance back in history you sort of see the the Everest peak of Shakespeare. Right. But, but there's it's all. Right. And we see those time to time. Newton's another one. You see these people pop out of nowhere, and then there's just like this enormous explosion and proliferation of thought in that vein. That's true, yeah. But I also think that that's an artifact of looking back in time. Like we keep we keep going back to this idea of the myth of the lone genius. Shakespeare was a product of his time, but because so few of us have an accurate sense of the time. So few of us have an accurate sense of our own time, right? We're we're limited to the no, things right. that we see on the internet, the things that we right. read in the newspapers, and the historian's work is to go back and to reconstruct a cohesive narrative of what people's experience was like. Right. And That's so right. I, I wonder if you have a sense of that cohesive narrative of experience of like what is the like how was the culture what was the culture war of the time or something not even necessarily the culture war but just what was it like over the course of a lifetime to have been born in let's say 1550 and then to die in 1620 like what is the arc of that life how does the world change mm. and what is the role of north and shakespeare in the way that world changes if any well two things uh the another th another thing to your point about that you'll you will find that a lot of times there are regions um in the world that just become uh known for some particular artistic explosion and that's because of all of the elements that end up in that region at that time whether it's uh art in italy um uh, during the renaissance and particular in certain cities and uh and london for writing 
and uh and for plays and it's not just uh it's not just shakespeare but it's uh it's uh you know marlowe and uh and and poetry as well sydney and uh johnson and uh, a lot of great a lot of great literature comes from that particular region and that particular area and there are mechanistic uh, you know there's way there are causes for this for these regions to do it you've philosophy in germany ireland had had an explosion in the early 20th century of in literature and there's all sorts of reasons for it and one of the reasons is simply because of the trap the all of the ideas that are hitting london and coming into london at the time that a lot of the uh some nobleman traveled when north would travel he'd bring back books that he got from in uh france and italy and um so all of these ideas were brought they with the and then with the advent of the public theater people just that's what they did at the time there was uh in terms of what it was like and i will continue with that point in terms of what it was like it's you're you're born into an aristocratic society so everything is classist you had to wear um what you wore it was clear who you were and what was um what station you were it was it wasn't easy but it was possible to move uh from one station uh to the other but uh everyone thought of different people and you will see this throughout the plays um there was very few ideas of actual democratic equality there's very few people even maybe montaigne was arguing it a little bit um there's very few people who i would consider you know who you would consider the 21st century progressive back then but there are but since there was humanism there was enlightened ideas and there was enlightened uh some enlightened ideas which uh which you could see were would uh lead to uh uh more progressive and more uh more democratic views that were starting to arise um so it was a kind of filthy rough class uh class oriented existence but there were glimmers there were glimmers around the uh uh around the outside in terms of the art that was being created and based on uh humanist ideas that would eventually become um universal and more uh and uh take over the world and it seems like the central theater allows people to come together and discuss things that are occurring in their world in a new way like it, it it puts it opens up yeah it opens up the floor to comment on societal level events in a way that you might not have in the case of just yeah. oral traditions or disparate uh storytellings and individual theaters it centralizes the narrative in an interesting way the centralization yeah. of the narrative is interesting right because when you have let's say every court yard has its own play it's very different than when every courtyard goes to the same play yeah yeah and and here's another just one more interesting thing about society is something to give you i think which really helps uh give a whole idea of the society you could go to the globe in 1600 <laughs> and or you could go to southwark so it was on the the globe theater was across the thames from london you could cross the uh london bridge to where you're going you could either go see which is right next to it bear baiting which had which is where you watched dogs uh, and a bear hunting dogs savage a chained bear in which the bear is trying to uh kill the dogs or you could go see hamlet so you got the you're getting you're getting one side you get the still the medieval savagery that is right then and there that the humans are just leaving out of and you've get some of the you know the the pinnacle of artistic achievement you know we really haven't oh. changed that much because you can basically spend all of your time watching horrific true crime recreations yes, right. of like weird it, right. sex crimes or yes. you can be reading, you know, the the treaties on, you know, AI yes. alignment. Right. I think it's worse than that because <laughs> at least you have the investigative aspect of that which like displays some sort of 
lessons and I I always go back to the new show that they're on one of the horrible channels which is Power Slap which is literally just people (laughs) slapping each other as hard as they can that's a good example (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's uh, a I I just bread bread and circuses yeah is is an eternal is an eternal principle and I guess go ahead you were you had you were going somewhere well I just think it's kind of obvious why the one succeeds when the other doesn't in the long term you know I mean there's obviously something extremely productive about people gathering around putting a drama on display and discussing how it relates to their lives in a way that actually seems to move the ball down the field it's interesting because I actually feel like the bear baiting was so successful that we still have it just as right. It's it's there. It's not like one conquers the other. It's not like Shakespeare has become the default mode of encountering the world, and everyone reads Shakespeare and everybody goes forth and and is thinking about Hamlet as they go through their lives. There's still a bifurcation where there's some people that go for the power slap and then there's some people that go for the literature. Probably the same people. I, in in terms of the spiritual vortex that continuously arises, yeah, for sure. That's you're not gonna, and this is this is where utopianism starts to fall apart because you go five hundred years back, and you see people doing the exact same stuff in you know dirtier, more filthy, more stringent conditions, and you go through all of these periods of reform and social justice and the desire to make things better and and just generations after generations of people working to change it and we're doing the same thing but we're dressed nicer and our houses are clean right right <sighs> it's depressing it seems like progress though to <laughs> me <laughs> mm, power slap seems like progress from a chained up bear just getting eaten by wolves you know it's like yeah it's hard to see these incremental steps i mean we i, I don't know yeah i think that history spirals forward it, it does circle back on itself but it does move forward it seems like to me I have a hard time believing that we are uh, just as primitive as we were a thousand years ago. Do you see people attempting to do with Shakespeare's plays what Shakespeare did with Thomas mm. North's work today? Yeah, all the time. You see, adapta- Lion King is Hamlet. Lion King 2 is Romeo and Juliet. Um, in fact, there's a very funny scene in um, South Park in which... Uh, <laughs> uh carmen is saying what's that one what's that one uh show in which uh the one boy from the one group falls in love with the other girl from the other group and the one kid says lion king too he says yes (laughs) um i love it oh man yeah and yeah how much of that yeah they keep on adapting. They keep on adapting. Shakespeare stories are never, these stories are never going to go away. And and those legends, by the way, they were old at the time when, uh, when uh, Thomas North first wrote them and then Shakespeare adapted them. Well, I was going to say untangling this is a little bit of a nightmare, even in evolutionary terms, because the pr- this process of convergence is occurring as well, right? I mean, like bugs and chickens developed wings for the same reason but not necessarily one from the other that's right and and so that's i think what's playing out with the archetypical underpinnings of a lot of these stories you know there's something built into us that understands them and needs to retell them yeah like do you have evidence from culturally so this is obviously very eurocentric because that's where where shakespeare was working and you have thomas north traveling around but they're not they're not ending up in china or india or Southeast Asia. And so is there a is there a parallel vein of similar writing that's emerging in those places that's making similar commentaries? You look like I've said something incorrect. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the so moral philosophy of Donny, which is actually it's a um which is named after Anton Francisco Donny, but they're really beast fables from India. They're Eastern uh beast fables from Indian Persia, and they all tell uh, stories of court life. And really, the uh, Othello really is based on one of the tales about this. It's with this Lion King, and um, he favors one of the counselors uh, over the other. He favors the bull over the mule, and the mule is going to exact revenge and convinces both of them to act in suspicious ways and tells the 
line that he's you know that the bull is going to to kill them and you see the passages and the and the dialogue it's very much like iago and othello uh in which iago is convincing othello to murder desdemona and he and he does it just like the mule and this is an ancient indian beast fable and it's and it's a concern which is true throughout a lot of a lot of this literature at the time of the flatterer of the guy of the evil guy who does not you know, hits you on the head with a club, but just whispers in your ear and how, and the psychological com- complexity that you see in this fable is really extraordinary. And you see a lot of the roots of the psychological complexity of Iago and how he's able to do it. One of the, one of the things is just acting like the reluctant confessor, which both Iago does and this mule does in the story. It's a very mature, bloody uh, beast fable in which, you know, he, he kind of doesn't want to admit it. He's pretending, no, I, I thought I saw something. I'm sure I'm wrong. And, the, you know, in both cases, that was, no, no, no. What, you know, what are you talking about? It's, well, I see things all the time. And then, you know, and just tries to, to where it seems like the lion or Othello is trying to coax the information out. There's all sorts of complexities like that that are done that are truly, um, that are truly mind blowing. But it, sh- it goes back into, it goes back into the East. So I'm afraid I don't, I don't think I answered your question, but you brought up uh, India and uh, China. Is, but there is a connection there between these between these tales, and that shows you how far they go back and how universal they are. Yeah, uh, is there a connectedness that's apparent, or is is it potentially a convergence? Is it possible that this is just a drama that plays out inside of us, and both cultures stumbled upon it in unrelated fashion? Well, I think. Well, there isn't. Um, it's not. It's des- definitely not convergence in Othello. Othello even and Iago even. Iago even compares himself to the mule uh, from Donnie. He c- compares himself to a mule. He doesn't mention the book, but and the curse of service and does a passage from from Donnie and and uh, Othello is meanwhile is discussed as a lion. Um, so that necessarily does derive from it. But I do think you are going to get tales like that of the evil flatterer, as you will get tales about all sorts of uh, human conditions, whether it's about jealousy or whatever, that will arise in different regions um, uh, for, for, uh, for the same reason, for the, because of the same aspects of human nature that is universal. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic that we discuss at home all the time. I've been just reviewing the history of astronomy going all the way back thousands and thousands of years, you know. Uh, and there are stories that are told in the sky of cultures that had no contact with one another. And the stories are very, very similar, you know. I'm thinking of, well, most of them, but particularly the Orion story with this hunter and this bull. I mean, you can find it in ancient oral traditions through aboriginal tribes in australia you can find it in mesoamerica you can find it in uh, obviously throughout europe uh, sumeria everywhere i mean you can right. find stories like this on there's bone tablets from thirty thousand years ago that illustrate a, a, a bull and a hunter and you have to you know anastasia often argues that perhaps they inherited this idea from a common ancestor, say, in Africa when humanity was first moving out. I mean, I honestly, I'm of the opinion that even the wolves are telling each other stories about the night sky, so I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm kind of more like, stories. well, it's just it's just a, a story that everybody's experiencing because everybody's hunting, and that's just reality for humans no matter where they're at and but I'm you always... can connect any number of dots in the sky to create a completely different figure but they don't that's the crazy thing is the fact that how is what well, is they one of the brightest this... most obvious apparitions so perhaps maybe that's the limit of it yeah but I, i'm just constantly is there a question in that? I, i'm just constantly uh sussing out how you can tease apart uh, the, the genealogy? Yeah, genealogy versus convergence in terms of all of these um, narratives that are so valuable to us, right? And particularly the reason they persist is it, they persist because people are really well networked or do they persist because they speak, sorry, because the authors are very well networked or does do they persist because they offer something so foundational to our souls and to our experiences on earth 
that they're fated to to do so. Yes, uh, one way you can tell in terms of convergence, it's precisely the same way you would with uh, with uh, organisms, in which you the organisms will share DNA, um, and you'll be able to uh, see through mitochondrial uh, DNA analyses w- where the family tree is and what particular uh, elements actually. Uh, derived independently whether it's uh flight or whatever whatever it may be and um it's the same thing with uh with with uh certain works or legends uh there will be some sort of unique dna that is shared or sometimes shared passed down to ones that directly derive from it that aren't converging certain sometimes it's language or it, names of the people et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that there's no way that someone's going to con- there's going to be a convergence of a story in which the same names are used so there's same that by in in terms of uh language if you have a line sometimes you get to seven words uh, seven words are often enough to be unique in the history of uh, of the English language. Uh, that may seem incredible, but there's thousands of words you can choose from. And the numbers, if you just, with each new word, it becomes less and less likely that this happened by chance. By seven words, there's no chance. Mm. So if you have even, even, what, even a seven-word string that doesn't even um, uh, seem that consequential, there's no way that occurred by chance. And sometimes there's rare phrases or unique phrases that are there. And so that's how you can tell when some work is necessarily dependent on an earlier work or just arose independently because of the shared experiences of the human race. Hmm. That'd be an interesting copyright standard. That's fascinating. I, it makes me think, though, that about the edges of genealogical research, particularly in bacteria and origins of life studies, where once you get back far enough to a very, I hate, I shudder to call them simple organisms, but once you get back to the basic structure of the cell. The early data. The early, the what? Like the early data, I think, right? Because okay. you're going okay, so back, let's, let's, let's assume that it's a database. And so there's a database of information that it has to do with like a, an er, a given species a long time ago. And, and, it, and it's hard to untangle what's going on at that point, right? It's hard to untangle where these trees broke off from one another because there's so they're they're doing very similar tasks at that point well the problem with bacterial genealogy is that okay so you have this tree of life and the tree of life is rooted on the the bacterial kingdom and you start looking at the bacteria and at some point you get to a place where you realize that they're kind of grouped into three distinct sort of sections and Inside of those sections, there's not a hierarchical order of these came first and then these evolved later because they're swapping DNA so aggressively. The, the, the life cycle of bacteria means that you're swapping plasmids. There's all these mobile genetic elements. And so the bottom of the tree of life is actually a, f- it's a foggy sea where things just mix freely oh. and there's not a sense of being able to go back and to to right. instill our order on it. And so I think that maybe the question is, when you're going back into these textual records and you see that there's chunks that are, are, are appearing from here or from there, is that universal across all of printed work at the time where you're seeing that you take uh, one book that's published in London and if you had all of the books that were published in London at the time, you would find that they were kind of aggressively exchanging bits of information or is that not the case it is partly the case so there is a lot of intertextuality particularly when you start getting into plays in the 1590s a lot of playwrights are borrowing lines from other from other uh from other playwrights whatever they they see a an applause line that works in one play and they and they'll Mm. take it there's (laughs) there is some borrowings but when when i when I'm studying to in order to knock down a source whether was this work necessarily uh, used for uh, used as a source for some later work. Uh, I do an early early English books online search to find out if there's any other uh, other any other work that uh, uses that uses that line or that particular phrase. And typically, it, there is no other work. Now, it's possible there's some other work or some intermediary work that was that has been lost that uses it. But once you find 
uh, once you find enough passages from this, you know, from work A that has descended and uh, that have ended up uh, in work B, uh, even if there is an intermediary work, it's it's rather a trivial fact simply because then that work shared all the things shared then that work had all those same passages and what you're doing is just finding another version or some sort of version which encompassed that work it 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 still necessarily uh confirms there's a connection between works a and b and um uh and that a is either the, the seminal the seminal source or in some way genetically related to that later text hmm. do you write plays yourself or do any kind of fictional work or anything like that I do not. Okay, okay. So I, I was going to say, it seemed like you would have a hell of an advantage. Like if you, you almost like a predictive power in terms of, you know, what would kill in the present time, having looked at the ascendance of all of these forms over time. I, I feel yeah. like you'd admit you'd make it a hell of a teacher, like a hell of a creative writing teacher in some sense as well. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Uh, if I do get time, maybe I'll, uh, I'll give it a try. <laughs> but I'm now, you know. Because I feel like this kind of understanding is just so valuable to anybody who's looking to make a mark, make their mark in the world, right? Especially in the realm of ideas, which is in some sense the holy grail of the intellectual. Yeah. How did you? Um, how did you get your book published by Oxford University Press? How did How did Here Be Dragons come to be a book that? you successfully sold to a publisher as someone who didn't come from a hardcore academic background. Right. Or any academic background. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like that's yeah. a pretty high bar that you, that you, that you cleared right there. Yes. So I did this. Yeah. That's uh, one thing maybe we want to discuss. Uh, you've, uh, you have a bunch of neglected geniuses out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. The, what I did with Shakespeare, I also did with uh, biogeography, I started, I looked around to find, first of all, with, with Shakespeare, I didn't come out with, uh, everything all at once. It was just little discoveries, a little bit at a time. And I found someone that who's, who I thought had written papers that were close to mine, who I thought, thought a little like me and it made similar conclusions about one particular aspect and then i and that was june schluter and i approached her with i said i think you're exactly right and i think this is an important paper and i said this is what i think actually happened and she read she read my work and she we started corresponding that way i did the exact same thing with biogeography with two uh significant biogeographers one michael heads the other multi ebuck both wonderful people. June Schluter is one of the greatest people on on earth. Open minded, realized that my my work needed a chance, and she was big. She was editor of Shakespeare Bulletin. These were two big biogeographers who thought a lot of my papers did have merit, and said they would go to bat for me. Um, and uh, tried, and so I got biogeographical papers published, and then they multi ebook just like walked me it figuratively walked me straight into Oxford University Press had had uh had had an editor there saying you don't have a book on biogeography this guy could write it and I was just introduced so what I did was I'm just cold calling people who I think would be amenable to certain parts of the ideas not something extraordinary really and I thought you know this is what I think then they went to bat with for me so instead of a a diploma. I just had top people saying, you know, uh, check out this guy's work, and we do think he's he's put in the work, and it's worth a it's worth a review, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Instead and that's of a- how. It, then I I the editor liked a few chapters I sent her, and it passed the board, which you know. So instead of a diploma, you had diplomacy, which I think is oh brilliant. <laughs> I think there's something to be said there. Yeah. No, that's absolute yeah. gold. I think that that is. That is some really, really good advice for people who come up with us. <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of already doing it. I mean, like like Nasia said, we're, we're trying to write our first book right now. And a lot of it is exactly that, right? We, we've fortunately through this podcast made friends with some pretty cool and well-established right. academics who don't would never agree with our thesis 
per se, Wholesale, but yeah. they, right. they, they, they do uh, overlap with our ideas to the extent that we can peg ourselves uh, to those projects that have been thoroughly developed inside of some formal setting. And it's, you know, we're trying to actually to find somebody like that for every chapter, essentially, you know, somebody who's right. who we can anchor the ideas in, in a way that's already been thoroughly digested by the, uh, the intellectual immune system. I think there's also a lot to be said. I have a tendency to get really excited about an idea and I want to sit somebody down and be like, check out this massive idea. And that almost always freaks people out because right. it just, there's, there's only so much of a frame shift that people can get before they get that's crazy. Right. That's right. And I think that that's the hallmark of people who aren't necessarily successful with these big ideas is that they don't have a sense of how to carefully, very gently introduce <laughs> people to the fact that the world is about to change and that that's okay. Right. And so right. I think that there's a lot of wisdom here. Uh, yeah, I think that's in some sense the hardest thing in the world. Because yeah, you're so excited about your own idea. Like, how long did right. you spend? Oh, I, so, what was? How long was the gap between? And, go ahead. And P.S. And you're st even doing that, and even being very gentle, and even getting people backing you, and top people backing you. You're still uh, <laughs> going to take a lot of insulting rejections not just mild rejections but you know <laughs> you know the most over the top things and you just have to be strong enough to take it and you have to realize this is coming i was warning michael blanding who probably never got a bad review in his life and he got great reviews for uh north by shakespeare or now it's in shakespeare's shadow which is a book on this on the thomas norris story and how we discovered it and He's, a, you know, he's an important writer. He's a New York Times bestselling author and uh, well-respected. And I'm saying, and I'm like, Michael, you're going to get, this is, you're going to get a lot of great reviews. You're also going to get the worst reviews. You've, you're not even going to believe what they're going to say about you and, and this book. And he kind of didn't believe it. And then, he, you know, there was some just completely unhinged. Reviews. It's just not, so you have to. You also have to be ready for that. That's going to happen. And this happens if you know the history of science. It happens to literally everyone. You know, if you're changing what people are very familiar with or what they are for, you know, if they've invented themselves, if they've written books on, they taught to others, they teach in their classes that their ego is intertwined with another idea. You've got zero chance a lot of times with a lot of these people, and they're going to hate you for what you've done. Yeah, that's a really important wisdom that needs to be imparted to next generation thinkers as well. I was really, sh I, I'm learning this one myself. And anybody who's had an idea and gone out and tried to explain it to an establishment has encountered this horror for the first time. I'm sure a lot of the people who yeah. were, who you know are working in projects related to this show. <laughs> it was cool. We 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 talked to Rupert Sheldrake and. It was one of the last things we talked about, and he said something about just how you have to understand that people people aren't they're not when they're when they're so violent and angry at you about something, it's not something to be taken personally. And if you can learn that that's a natural response and it has nothing to do with you, and you're just right. the vehicle by which they exercise this. I don't know, collapse into chaos that your idea might cause to them, um, you can really learn to have it not be such a painful experience. And, right. you know, that's something that's easier said than done. I'm still trying to figure out how to do that myself. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, it's hard for somebody to just sit there and yell at you and uh, tell you you're a moron when, you know, to patiently sit back and, why do you right. think that? And Tell me, yeah. tell me how you arrived at that conclusion and let them kind of hang themselves is a, a very challenging right. thing to pull off. I think yeah. that I have an easier time with this than most people because in our, in our experience, I've always been the one who's just like, no, 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 this is like an expected reaction. Like this is, we probably have to do some like political, carefully, some diplomacy in order mm -hmm. to get around it. Right. But I grew up in a family where it was a constant war of ideas like being the smartest person in the room was the gold standard in the family at all times. And so there was, I grew up with this 
volatile world of ideas and being able to make these logical presentations. And I was never as sharp as my siblings. Like they're faster than me and they have more recall than I do. And so they're able to, to cross-reference things much more effectively. And so from a young age, I learned that diplomacy was the only way. I was like, I'm not going to well, win. You must, you must come from a very, very bright family. <laughs> Uh, they're all they're all like software engineers extraordinaire. It's it's crazy. They're like very, very, very technical people. Like when I was a kid, my dad would make us do math tricks in the car. And I can't, to this day, I cannot do mental math. Like I have to write it out. And he's like trying to get us to solve like differential equations while we we're like on a road trip. It was terrible. <laughs> it's absolutely terrible. But it prepared me for this. And I don't know if it's Well, the intelligence and uh, openness to new ideas are are totally different realms right. of right. personality. I mean, you can crunch numbers all day long, but that actually might prevent you from being open to new interpretations of data. Yeah, I just see people getting so sucked into wars in in the academic world, where the I think that there is this desire to exert your power over the realm of ideas, and you win status points mm -hmm. for doing that. And so everyone, I, sometimes I dissociate from the game of humans and I look at them and I'm like, you realize that you're forcing each other into these terrible confirmations just simply by virtue of the way that you're reacting to each other. And if either one of you at any point decided to break the game, you'd be able to redirect and suddenly have a completely different experience. Like if right. you showed up and people gave you bad reviews and were mean, and then you went unhinged, and you started, you know, no, screaming know. at them in public, and telling them how, you know, giving them bad reviews, that's, that's all that it takes for you basically to be booted out on some reputational hierarchy, because you're the newcomer, you're not playing by the rules, you've created an immune reaction that's able to end your, end your prospects, and that's it. And it's so yeah. hard for people to get to that point, and then to, to sort of, to step out of the game and to get control of that really visceral process. Because when somebody tells you that your ideas are bad, is that really any different than them telling you that you're bad? Well, they right, will tell right. you you're bad. They'll tell you you're a moron for even <laughs> having the idea, right? That's usually the, the thing yeah. that, that I've encountered so many times, right? Yeah. It's like if you have a slight, slightly different... Like one of our projects on the show is, is trying to make material representations of quantum mechanical mathematics and uh yeah it's like like half the people will say like oh you think you're smarter than einstein and and you're just like no like this is... and then uh, the other half are just like you're a complete moron and and so it's uh it's always a very interesting challenge to unpack that in a way that's constructive but it is successful if you if you don't respond with anger and you respond with curiosity instead you can actually I, we've had people like even in the YouTube comments who have completely changed their minds, you know, as a result. Of, oh, I'm. They'll come back. Oh, yeah, I was sorry. I was drinking last night, or <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, I have a tendency to get unhinged in the YouTube comment section or something, right? And it's wild because uh, really all you have to do is just chill. Chill. Just chill. Yeah. Did, has it changed? Has it gotten easier over time as you've published more work? Uh, for me to deal. And just for the ways that people have reacted to, right? Where as you as you produce a progressively larger body of work that seems to point to the same thing in a very sort of calm and insistent way. Uh, the I've I've learned to deal what I when I keep finding more and more, I think starts making certain people more and more uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I yeah, I try to be good i i will occasionally get in debates online and uh <laughs> and but i i try to uh i do try to work as hard as i can to take everything with a grain of salt and i since it's really stupid of me to take any sort of bait whatsoever considering i know it's coming i i've already i know the history of all this i'm expecting it i wa warning you know people like michael blanding it's coming and then you know if i do take a bait it's um uh, uh i i wrote a, a a one uh paper that kind of took on one review a little bit because they thought the guy went over the top and uh that's about all in terms of really uh, anything that I've kind of published that was um, in which I kind of took the 
I kind of took the gloves off. But um, other than that, I've been fairly good. Did it feel Did it feel good to publish it, or did you publish it and then later pu- come around? I I published it uh, myself. He really had this coming, and uh, <laughs> and I tried to do it kind of cute, but I published it on my uh, on a academic on a, a academic website paper. But I had to address his arguments. Uh, I felt there, you know, and. And, um, uh, but I, but other than that, I've been fairly, I've ignored most of the criticisms and, you know, most of the, if, if someone tries to come up with, if someone has something substantial to say that I feel he's arguing some sort of fact, or she's arguing some sort of fact that needs to be addressed, I will address that. But other than that, you know. So you've... You played with some other ideas in your life too. <laughs> did did well, I? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm very much into material causality, and uh, and so I would. Uh, so I agree a lot with the uh, with physicists who typically invented the the equations of electromagnetism or. Um, or light or the various equations involving light um, that I think are more have simpler, more not have more realistic ex- explanations. I think all of physics has the correct equations. It's just the explanations for them. Interesting. Yeah. That's such a tricky topic to get into with people because uh, you're not, taking aim at the accuracy of the mathematical descriptions you know i i had to i had to do a lecture on black holes yesterday and uh, i was just absolutely sleepless getting ready for this thing because it's one of those situations as well where you have extraordinary empirical data which is fit extraordinarily tied to equations but the conclusions are essentially magic and that's such a fine line to walk when you get into these discussions with people, um, especially because physics forms the basis of people's fundamental understanding of reality, right? And so to attack right. such a foundation, I, I mean, hopefully you're not perceived as attacking it, but to even question the foundation, like, eh, there might be a crack over here. People are just like, shut up. Don't get involved in this. Calculate. Right. right. Well, it, it, yeah, so here's what I would say about... Uh, my views on physics, there's a lot of uh, fluid dynamic equations that also describe gravitational fields, that describe uh, electromagnetism, and a lot of times at the same same equations with light, whether it's uh, Biot-Savar effect or Doppler or Sagnac or even the Lorentz transformations, you can have um, hydrodynamic equations for that. You've got, as you have black holes, you have... Uh, uh, dumb holes in fluids where sound can't escape, just like light. And you have um, all sorts of the equations, general relativity equations also fall in. And a lot of the people that originally discovered these equations uh, uh, were were thinking of it in terms of fluid dynamics or hydrodynamics or ether field, et cetera. So I think of more of a, I think those original you know, I take Sanyak's view of the Sanyak equation. I take, um, you know, Lorentz's view of the Lorentz transformations. You know, the, all the Bio Savar, Michelson's view of the uh, uh, Maxwell's view of Maxwell equations, et cetera. And even Michelson Morley's view of their own experiments, et cetera. Uh, so that's, uh, that's about how, where I am. I don't think it's a coincidence that they're all fluid dynamic equations that there are. And I think there is... Um, and, and they're and they're congruent. That's what's really interesting, right? I, I just don't want to gloss over that too fast. The Lorentz relativity is equivalent to Einsteinian relativity in that it, right. the predictions would be the same, but Lorentz kept an ether in his model, right? And you know whether and 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 this is what's really important here is that the same equations can describe two different phenomena, but they can map onto it really really similarly. Like uh, heat's a great example, right? Heat also can be 
modeled perfectly as a fluid transfer and people actually thought of it as a fluid for many many years um right. and it works perfectly of course we understood eventually that it was the vibration yeah, of, of yeah. molecules but it works perfectly right. um and so i think that going back to fluid analogies is a really good starting point for reimagining how things might work on a material basis because there there are a, a lot of parallels there um, I think it takes the magic out of it. Exactly, exactly. And people want that magic too. That's that's I one know. thing I was really struggling with with this black hole lecture was, you know, I, I felt, I, every time I talk about this stuff, I feel like I'm breaking people's hearts and I, it's not a good feeling, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. you, you know, the enlightenment really ripped religion and superstition away from people in a way that I don't think was totally healthy. I think people... <laughs> And I, I fundamentally, I, I feel like there is a lot of magic in the universe, but it's actually, it's actually in biology and in human experience and interactions and like this thing, where do ideas come from? You know, where, where does inspiration come from? Where does love and heroism and there's, there is a lot of magic, but. Like it, pure materialism is a really depressing worldview. Yeah. And a story, a cosmology that's purely materialistic is missing pieces and that and you can't just take them away from people right people know it's missing and they're going to try to stick it inside of black holes or right. space-time warpage or whatever they can come up with because they're not going to let go of that magic they know it's there and uh and it's also the magic of the lone genius right they want to know the magic of shakespeare they want to know the magic of right. something that happens that defies imagination and defies belief right I, there's there's an interesting thing in terms of uh, physicists, particularly, um, have always kind of, if they were presented with two particular uh, theories or three, two particular explanations for some phenomenon or for why their equations work, what what always ended up surviving is the most fantastic one. Whatever is the wildest, whatever is the wildest uh, interpretation, it. It's uh, and geologists and ge and geophysicists. Geologists are kind of the exact opposite, where they refuse to believe anything daring. Like their their view for throughout the nineteenth and twentieth century was that nothing moved, so that the continents are fixed. It was continental fixism, and they fought anything remotely daring. Whereas physicists almost refuse to believe anything remotely sane. It's like where you're dealing with two opposite people, and a lot of times the truth is. The truth is uh, right in the middle. Interesting. Why do you think that there's this divergence in those two sciences? I just, it's the type of personalities that go into the field. Uh, I mean, if you, you know, well, for also the, the, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Um, if a lot of physicists are now uh, mathematicians and I believe there is a reasonable, I believe there's a coherent uh, explanation for why mathematics works to explain the, the universe but when you're using these equations that are just predicting these uh predicting all these events to an astonishing degree it seems like that you're in a universe that is just that is just following these magical equations and um you're you really you, you get the sense of why I even try to explain this in any sort of rational or mechanistic way that's mm. following the the equations but it, the reason that they follow the equations is that, you know, we're writing the equations to describe it, it, mathematics is just a symbolic language. It's, it's like English and there's, it's a shorthand deterministic language. And for every single equation that you have in physics, there's a long paragraph in English or in any language. Yeah. It, yeah. That uh, it, I was going to say, that's why it's that probably it not really even a language, right? We, we've made a little video about this a while back, but it's like, you, it's actually, if you really think about what mathematics is, it's only quantitative adverbs, essentially. And you can't make a sentence out of quantitative adverbs. Like, you're always going to require some language to accompany it to explain what your variables mean and how they apply right. to the system. And right. so it's this really constrained view that ultimately can only provide you a statement of what is happening objectively. Right. That doesn't mean that it explains the cause of what's happening, though. That's and this right. Is it doesn't something give that, the cause. And that seems to be a question that is continually kicked over to somebody else. Like you, you go to these physicists and ask them about the cause thing. They're like, that's not really what we do. And so, 
you know, you try right. to go to the philosophy yeah. department. They're like, that's not what we do. The physicists do that. You're like, no, 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 they don't right. actually. Um, right. Well, it's much easier to say that if you flip a coin, you're going to get 50-50 chance of it coming down on either side versus sitting down and exploring why it is that given the same initial starting conditions that you end up getting different outcomes, right? That's, a, that's yeah. just a much trickier... That's a much trickier thing to do, and it doesn't have as much glory because I think that part of what grabs people's hearts and minds is something that they can't quite totally understand. The more mist the more sort of vaseline on the lens that you have when you look at these things, the more that people are drawn into them. Photorealism yep. is not as as captivating as impressionism. Oh, that's yeah, that's a nice analogy, right? Right. But boy, did impressionism piss people off when it first came around, right? <laughs> it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, that's that's true too. That's true too. I guess I'm thinking about it from the contemporary lens right now, which is like there's a difference between like somebody who takes a photo with their phone versus somebody who makes a piece of art that deals with the the scene. Like the 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 photograph might be less what draws you in because there's some ineffable quality of mystery to to the interpretation. And people really like the mystery and as you erase it, it becomes it, the world becomes harder and harder to live in. And mathematics is kind of a perfect place to to store that mystery because it strikes fear into the heart of so many people yeah. where you you're like, well, we have we have the math for this and the math goes on for 48 pages and they're like, oh, you must be really smart. Yeah. And and so you just leave it. Right. And they the mathematicians sit together and they and they discuss their ideas and they argue about, you know, what it's the 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 400th term on page 32. And right. that's where that lives. And when somebody comes around and proposes that perhaps there are other ways that we can encounter this. That just gets tossed out of the academy because it's not the level of discourse that is accepted as being academic. And so that's actually, that ties back to, to a question I had about your work, which is, do you feel like you write for an academic audience or do you write for a general audience? I write for a general audience, unless I'm, um, for articles in journals, I write for an academic audience, but for my books, um, particularly the latest Thomas North book is for assuming people that really don't know much about Shakespeare. So I explain a lot and explain a lot about what happened at the times. Is that a strategic uh, choice? Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to do an end around. I know that I only, my success directly in the Shakespeare community is going to be limited and I need to do an end around where people start hopefully Getting it, say, you know, the, this guy seems to be right about Thomas North, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and start and uh, and creating some sort of buzz uh, that way. Um, more than uh, I've I've gone as far as I can as a, I I can no longer act like a mole inside the Shakespeare thing. They now know exactly what my uh, intentions are all throughout. So that's over. But you know, going back to the point, I'll, the equations of uh, the molecular theory of gases. Physicists didn't accept the idea of atoms until the 20th century, which is off the charts insane. And but that was because they had the equations that worked. And uh, you know, John James Waterston had the uh, had developed the molecular theory of gases, explaining the equations of pressure and volume and temperature. Etc. Just writing them out and how just bouncing around the molecules, just moving around inside, will necessarily give you these equations that he couldn't get published. And uh, and you know when you and the one you know reviewer talked about how ridiculous it was, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This is nineteen. This is nineteenth century. This is eighteen twenties or thirties. And um, well, know, ultimately it, be well. it became untenable, right? Because they were tr they found that essentially heat was inexhaustible in these cannon boring projects when they were trying to, you know, they realized as long as there was friction being supplied, they could get heat forever. You would never drain the caloric out of right. a substance. Right. And yeah. We've, but we've, they were even, they were even, this is even beyond caloric. They, they were even, they were arguing just kind of invisible forces that were forcing th things apart. But yeah, you're right. Caloric couldn't stand, uh, you know, for, 
for only a like the time for for reasons as you said there's a project that we really want to do at some points which is the same concept applied to the the idea of the electron which is also sort of this magical fluid in a sense and i would love to figure out a way to set up some sort of because triple electricity the the static electricity concept is that you can generate electricity by through friction as well which is similar to heat and you know, it seems like according to the standard model of the electron, you should be able to exhaust the substance of its electrons at some points. And I would love to like think of a similar oh, cannon to... boring project. I, yeah. I haven't figured out how to set one up, but I'd love to come up with a cheap way of insulating a material and trying to drain its electrons from it because I don't think that it's possible. And I think that um, this would revolutionize our way of understanding that the electron's actually just an activity of the atom as opposed to this substance that gets handed off from atom to atom. Like you can imagine like a glass interesting. sphere. It's on an a, interesting analogy. I'm you, sorry. You can imagine like a glass sphere on a piece of wool and you peer and like the, the or sorry, a glass sphere like on a drill that you rub against the wool and then you have a little rod that discharges it and then you just keep moving it back and forth. And like, does the glass ever lose the electrons? Right. Right, and I I don't know. We're if gonna that, do it eventually. We gotta design this thing properly. I but, wanna I wanna yeah. make sure that that is that that's a that's a test that people would predict f- coming down in two directions. And I'm not right. sure, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure yet if if the well the I'm sure theory. that people argued for I don't I'd have to go back and look but I'm sure that people argued that it was getting its caloric from somewhere else for quite a while and that yeah, you know it wasn't true, properly too. grounded yeah. and all of this but right. eventually like when somebody supplies a better alternative and they're like no no no, no this is what I think is happening this makes a lot more sense uh, finally I, I think that gives it cause to move forward yeah do you think that you're gonna it even do... takes a while <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly even yeah. then it. T- do you think they're uh, going to do more work in in physics and and these more material sciences, or, or do you think that you're going to stick with Shakespeare for a while? I do think I'll come back. Um, I've got uh, just a few more things to produce. For uh, there's more there's more stuff coming on Thomas North and Shakespeare, and um, uh, I and once I do that, I will try I will try to gently come back into uh into physics and uh geophysics where does this where does this come from in you this desire to to figure these things out well i i just never wanted to you know lend my voice to a chorus of a billion eyes i didn't want to just take what other people have done and extend the decimal point and i think human wisdom is is uh correct in most things i'm not really a contrarian i i don't i'm not looking to disagree with things but i think there's certain uh certain moment at all times there's certain uh things that the human race takes for granted certain conventional views which i think are just a little off and i think the uh i've always been attracted to those parts where i think people may be wrong and uh, groups and and I could add some important information to to the subject or to the debate. And I've always I've always been interested in that. And that's what I've set myself up uh trying to do to add some information to the to the world. I like that. Um bef- so I have one last thing that I wanted to ask you about. Decompressing Earth. Care to comment on it or do you want to stay away from that? Yeah. Well I I would Kind of care to stay. I uh, stay away, but there are um, uh, there are hydrodynamic views of gravity, which would necessarily require at least um, all planets and moons to be geologically active, and uh, and I think that is more likely to be true that that's the case than not, and that's because matter is gathering at the cores, and so. The question of whether the Earth, uh, well, everyone knows that planets and moons expanded at some point. Uh, they didn't pop into their pop into existence at their present size. The question of whether there's any post-formation expansion or post-formation expulsion of material uh, that is gathering at the cores uh, is, I think, an unresolved question. 
And I think there is some evidence that the Earth um, did not com- was not at its current size four and a half billion years ago, but has since increased in radius at least somewhat uh, since that time, and even over the last two hundred million years. But that's a very controversial thing to say. I don't want to say two controversial things at the same time. <laughs> I got you. No, I actually yeah. think that it's. Uh, I think it's actually a. I, I was surprised in. Um, going back and reviewing, well, the most recent planetary science studies that are coming out, because they don't really per se address this idea that planets might change size, but they do in the sense that when we, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, started getting a pretty decent catalog of exoplanetary systems, we noticed that they really looked nothing like ours. And all of our planetary formation models were based on the assumption that that solar systems look like this. And right. what they're finding is that there are big, giant planets that are cooking down into much smaller planets. This is absolutely a very common thing that's occurring throughout the visible cosmos. So, gassy planets that are losing their atmosphere And icy ones, right? And so, a consequence of that necessarily is that their cores decompress. And a consequence of decompression is an expansion of volume. And so, while the idea that this is what happened on Earth is absolutely heretical, the idea that it is a necessary consequence of the observations that we're making at this point in other systems is surprisingly evident and and accepted to a certain degree, at least in the literature. I don't know about in popular uh, dialogues and so forth, but... Nobody's made the nobody's made the jump yet, right? So it's like I think right. they were at a very tantalizing place where there's it's called the like the hot Neptune uh, theory or hot um, Jupiters. Um, yeah, and so you have all these gas giants Neptunes. that are close into their suns, and their their atmospheres are getting blown away. And if the atmosphere and and no one is yet coming out and being like, hey, those cores probably expand, even though that's inherent to. And hey, the cores the look a lot like Earth's layering and so yeah, on. And so exactly. Forth. Yeah, exactly. So there's like, I think that there's probably, if you come back around to this topic another 10 years from now, I think that it, the, right. the science will have shifted sufficiently. And hopefully we'll, we'll have had a hand in that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. That's yeah. good. Ganymede, by the way, I, I think it's now fairly conventional that uh, Ganymede has, has expanded and uh, stretch marks. And, yeah. They, well, yeah. I, and it's not even that, it's riftings that they can't, you know, that obviously the, um, that obviously where the, where the, the outer crust has broken apart and new material has, has come up, which we have on earth as well. I mean, there's a lot to think about here. Um, and so I think that we should, we actually have a, another meeting in eight minutes. Oh, so. oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's just Jeez, like, it's, I didn't think. I actually, didn't no, think no, no, no. That's not until, uh, that's not, we, it's not until two. Oh, it's not so yeah. too. Okay. So we have a half that's hour good. and eight minutes. Oh, okay. That's good. 38 minutes. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, this is certainly a lot to chew on. I just, I think that it's very uh-huh. cool. I uh, I think that I too was, I was like, I wonder what what two, two and a half hours would, would look like. But I think that it's been, I think it's been really good. Well, you two are so wonderful at the interviewing oh. process and you have very intelligent commentary on everything. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. It's it's been really good getting your getting your perspective on these things, and we would definitely love to have you back as you as you write more and you publish more and you think more. And when you're ready to tackle other controversial subjects, to open those cans as well. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, where can question. people Where can people find you? Okay, so Thomas North or Thomasnorth dot com, uh, and I my book is on Amazon Kindle. It'll soon be on Google Play, and. Um, I have a uh, Twitter. Okay. Daniel oh, McCarthy, nice. and uh, there's a Facebook line, a North Shakespeare discussion, Facebook uh, group, et cetera. Thomas North, the original author of Shakespeare plays. All right, guys. And pick up this book. We'll, we'll put a link to it in the description. That's but, uh cool. Yeah, support this. And yeah, you actually support both of us when, when you buy the book off that link, too. So. Help us all out, and you're going to love it yes. anyways. So, yeah. Anyways, thanks for coming by, man. It's been really cool. Thank to talk you. To you. Really Thank fun. you so much. Thank you.